Welcome to this section on gonadal function. First, we're gonna start with the male testes. They're a pair of ovoid or organs in the male that produce sperm and they create reproductive steroid hormones. One of those hormones is testosterone. In the embryonic stage, it aids in the development and differentiation of primordial gonads. After puberty, it helps with sperm production and maintains secondary sexual characteristics. It's very important to note that it is the most biologically active, naturally occurring androgen. Some other things that the testes do is spermatogenesis, or the production of sperm. This sp starts with spermatogonia, which are stem cells that form sperm. Spermatogonia undergo mitosis and meiosis, and then haploid cells transform to form mature sperm. The mature sperm has a head, body, and a tail so it can swim. The other things the testes do is the hormonogenesis and the testosterone that we just mentioned. Testosterone is actually controlled by FSH and LH, which are prepared by, produced by the gonadotrophs. There are two, the FSH and LH, the two hormones that are controlled are um, FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, which aids testosterone in the making of the sperm, and LH, or luteinizing hormone, which stimulates the production of testosterone by acting on Leydig cells. There is some hormonal control of testicular function. The first thing that happens is the hypothalamus, which we talked about in prior chapters, secretes gonadotropin-releasing hormone in a pulsatile manner. This causes the release of the testosterone, which is a principal androgen hormone in the blood, which is the most biologically active, as we just mentioned. Those hormone levels do fluctuate within the blood. Once the testosterone is in the blood, it enters a cell and converts to dihydroxytestosterone. This dihydroxytestosterone complexes with an intracellular receptor protein, and that complex then binds to a nuclear receptor, affecting protein synthesis and cell growth. We can have some disorders of the testicular function. Um, two of them that we're gonna mention, hypergonadotropic hypogonadism and hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. The first one is Klinefelter syndrome. With Klinefelter syndrome, we see a decreased testosterone with an increased FSH and LH. With those patients, we see testicular feminization syndrome, or small testicles, myotonic dystrophy, which is kind of a, a small musculature, gynecomastia, which is um, breast growing in the male, and this can occur with testicular injury and infection, if there's issues there. But many of these patients do have an extra X chromosome, which will cause this problem. The next one is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. This is known as Kalman's syndrome. With this, everything is decreased, no, low testosterone, low FSH, and LH. In these patients, we see hyperprolactinemia, which can cause lactation in males, and is usually caused from a pituitary disorder. So in these patients that have these, testi these uh, testosterone issues where they're decreased, there are some therapies that are available. They can do a parenteral testosterone, which is an IM injection, a transdermal patch, a testosterone gel applied to the skin, or a, um, a tablet that is placed in the mouth. Now with these, there are some issues that can occur, so they really have to monitor the amount of testosterone they're getting and some of the things that can occur in the body once they're taking this artificial testosterone. One of the things they test is that prostate-specific antigen. They do a blood count, they check their lipid levels, and they need to be rechecked three to six months after initiation and yearly thereafter. We need to watch for leg edema, sleep apnea, prostate enlargement. It can reduce sperm count. Um, and it can cause prostate cancer as well. So somebody being put on testosterone placement um, replacement is something that is uh, kind of a decision between the physician and the patient, but there can be these side effects. So we have to make sure the benefits are outweighing the side effects in each case. The next one is the ovary. These are paired, ov paired organs with dual functions. The gamete, or ovum, produ ovum production, is one function, and steroid hormone production is the other. Hormones from the hypothalamus, pituitary, and ovaries prepare the uterus for implantation of the embryo. There are several estrogen or several hormones available to um, help with this process. 
The first one you need to be familiar with is estrogen. This one is responsible for promoting growth in the uterus, fallopian tubes, vagina, breasts, external genitalia, and depositing fat in the female distribution. Progesterone readies the uterus for pregnancy and the breast for lactation. FSH promotes growth of the follicles and LH triggers ovulation. It's also important to make note in the absence of implantation, a uterine lining is shed, which is known as menses. So what about the functional anatomy of the ovary? Well, we talked a little bit that the fact there's two oval or ovoid organs, they're located in the pelvic fossa. They're positioned near the end of the fallopian tubes. Each one is about two to five centimeters in length and weighs about 14 grams. And they contain two to four million primordial follicles, which you actually have at birth. So there are different phases of what the ovary goes through. The first one is the follicular phase. This begins with the onset of menses and ends on the day of an LH surge. A rise in the FSH stimulates estrogen production. The graphene follicle is the remaining follicle containing a mature ovum. The luteal phase, the graphene follicle releases the ovum into response to the, to the LH. It starts with the extrusion of the ovum and ends with the onset of menses. Luteinization is where the graphene follicle develops into a corpus luteum. Here's a picture of the entire menstrual cycle in a picture, because I'm a person that really likes pictures. Um, it starts with the beginning, which is menstruation. Okay, this is the follicular phase. In this, everything is relatively low. FSH is low, estradiol is low, luteinizing hormones low, progesterone is low. Once we hit the end of the follicular phase, heading in towards ovulation, estradiol starts to increase, and we get that sharp spike in luteinizing hormone. This causes the release of the egg, which is known as ovulation. As you can see in the bottom here, we are continuing to have a growth of the uterine wall. This is to prepare for the egg, which we had in the ovulation phase, to um, implant itself in the uterine lining. With progesterone, we see there's a higher level of progesterone during that phase to keep that uterine wall um, growing. Progesterone drops, and then we end up back in menstruation again. We do have hormonal control of ovulation. So when those um, the eggs do release, we just talked about luteinizing hormone, do that. But the central control of FSH and LH secretion from the anterior pituitary resides in gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus, just as it did with the male with testosterone and the gonadotropin releasing hormone. Positive and negative feedback um, responses do exist. So when it gets too high, the body knows when to lower it. When it gets too low, it knows when to increase it. A mid-cycle surge in LH production stimulates a series of events that culminates in ovulation with FSH levels falling thereafter. One of the things that we can do in the lab is we do check FSH and LH um, on women sometimes. And doing an LH level in the um, luteinizing phase would show that ovulation is in fact happening. With hormonal um, development, we look at pubertal development in the female. The development of breast tissue usually happens first, then they get pubic hair, and then menses happens third. They can measure this by using a tanner staging system. There are abnormalities within the menstrual cycle. Amenorrhea means absence of menses. Oligomenorrhea is infrequent or irregular menstrual bleeding. Hypogonadotropic hypogonadism is a deficiency of FSH and LH, which can cause amenorrhea. So that would be something we may test for in the laboratory. Hypergonadotropic hypogonadism is ovarian failure, but they do have elevated FSH. The last one, polycystic ovarian syndrome, is somewhat common. Um, these patients tend to be obese, which I don't have listed here. But we see infertility, hirsutism, which we'll talk about in a minute chronic anovulation, glucose intolerance, hyperlipidemia or dyslipidemia, and having high blood pressure. Here's the hirsutism I just mentioned. It's an abnormal, abundant, androgen-sensitive terminal hair growth. It's usually idiopathic in 60% of people, which means we don't know why it happens, or if you have polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is in 35% of patients. Um, usually we have to look at the woman's ethnic origin as well because some nationalities just tend to be hairier than others, so they do look at that. But otherwise we do use the Ferriman-Galway scale. 
And by we, I mean the physicians, not the laboratory. <laughs> There's nine areas they look at, the lip, the chin, sideboard region, the neck, chest, abdomen, upper and lower back, and thigh. And they give them points, one to four, based on hair thickness and pigmentation. A score of greater than eight is a diagnosis of hirsutism. So what we can do with women that may be suffering with low estrogen levels is um, give estrogen replacement therapy. This really remains a contentious issue. If you've known any women in their um, 50s and 60s who were seeking some uh, respite from menopausal issues, hot flashes and things, they may have been put on hormone replacement therapy. And what can happen is we can see an increased breast cancer and clot formation in these patients. Um, there was really no benefit in the cognitive de decline or coronary artery disease, but we did see a reduction in bone loss, colon polyp formation, menopausal symptoms such as hot flashes and vaginal dryness. So it, it's, it's kind of a, um, a, a patient decision. Um, you do have a lot of risks with the cancer, but it will reduce all of those other symptoms. So it does remain a treatment option for patients, but they do have to go through risk counseling first. The last thing I'd like to mention is the placenta itself. The placenta secretes estrogen, progesterone, and beta HCG, but it also secretes human placental lactogen. This has very potent lactogenic properties. The placenta secretes one to two grams of it a day, which is the most of any hormone. Very, very powerful. So this is the last slide for our gonadal function. Have a wonderful day.